this other gentleman, uh, he either directed this film, I can't find a lot of information, um, or he was part of the camera crew or something. He was a cinematographer. Very interesting. He died at the age of 56 in 1993. The cinematographer died in a horrible way. He was again doing his cinematography. He was testing out a um, experimental aircraft, I guess, or hot air balloon uh, above the jungles. And uh, he got tangled up, he removed his safety belt, and he plunged 50 meters to his death on the jungle floor. Eleven years ago, Gertz Dieter Plager died in Sumatra in an accident in a project where I was working with him. We were using a, a one-man airship, the small airship, to film the forest canopy. We took off, he took off in the morning, a little bit late, there were lots of delays. He decided to mount the camera on the front of the airship looking back at him. Took off a little bit late and there was a slight wind, not much, it was very calm. The airship flew up a river just like this, calmly disappeared over the canopy. It circled, we could see it in the distance going across the canopy while he was filming, but it started getting a little bit higher than I expected and there seemed to be a problem. Then we radioed him and the first problem we had was that the radios didn't work, they hadn't been charged properly. The airship descended some way away over the canopy and one member of the team took bearings to, to see where it would come down. He stood, stood on a big cliff ledge and watched where it came down. And then very calmly, and very professionally, we arranged a team to go out and meet the airship. But I could see the airship up on a tree, perched on a tree. With, with Dieter was up there sitting in the seat quite calmly. In fact, I watched him sitting there as some birds p passed above and he managed to lift the nose but the, the camera that he'd put at the start was was caught on a branch and it wouldn't loosen and he couldn't reach it I saw him unbuckle his seat but he wasn't wearing a harness and he tried to reach out to the camera we waited again and I saw this big bank of clouds getting close closer and closer it was it was a light blue sky like we have now but this cloud was big gray blank coming in and I could see the, the rustling of the treetops and then it just moved in very rapidly. And I could see the, the, the frame of the airship on the tree rocking like a bronco. And I could see Dieter holding on. And then <clears throat> something I didn't quite believe, I saw it rock really hard and it broke the frame of the airship. And I saw him lurch forwards and fall out. The tree was more, maybe 50 or 70 meters high. And I knew that if somebody fell from that, they would be killed once well, I realised, but I just didn't believe it. And so I ran back into the forest. It was very dark in there. When you looked up, it was pitch black. It just little vague lights from the light coming through. But he hadn't fallen, and I, and I was, thought, well, I must have been mistaken. I must have dreamt it. I waited a period of about five minutes, and the others waited, and Freedom was with me, just told me to shh, be quiet. We heard some cracking of branches. And what had happened, another member of the team, Marcus, had climbed very cleverly to it, up another tree. The tree he was on was dead and breaking anyway, but Marcus had climbed another tree and got within two metres, I found out later, of Dieter. And the airship was lodged with Dieter holding on to the part of the airship or part of a branch. And he very calmly said to Marcus, pull me over. And Marcus pulled the rope towards him. And this must have dislodged the airship from where it was. And then Dieter did fall. I was standing at the base of the canopy and then I saw something that I'll never forget. I saw this man coming down, holding his head, lying on his side, falling through the air past me. It was like in slow motion, I can still see that. Even though it happened very rapidly, I could still see it falling. And then I hear, heard him hit the ground with a thud. The terrible thing is it was like, meat in a butcher shop. 
slamming down on the ground. The ground was soft and peaty, and he, he, we thought he was dead at first. He was half buried in this peat. He'd lost an eye, and so he looked a bit of a mess. We assumed he was dead, but as I looked down at the detail, I realised he was alive because his other eye opened. And then freedom was brilliant because we just, in lightning speed, to put together a stretcher. We took off our shirts, tied the stretcher, and very carefully lifted him onto the stretcher. We got him across the river with two Indian, uh, sorry, Indonesian porters. And there was a mud track on the far side of the bank. We got him there. But when I got him to the far side, it was clear his breathing was getting worse. He had this sort of moaning sound, but then he started sounding calmer. And I said to him, the last thing I said to him was that he, something's face, I don't know, I, I, I just said, you're looking better, Dieter which of course it wasn't. And uh, we lifted him up on this mud path, this very narrow ledge, and there was a terrible moment at that point where we actually felt we were going to slip down the bank and his body would fall into the river, and, and the four of us were concentrating hard on doing this. And just as we reached the canopy height, we heard him stop breathing. We couldn't, I couldn't look back because I was at the front. We got to the top of the road, and uh, I looked at him, and I've never seen a dead body before in my life. And I looked at his body and I realised he was dead. Uh, if I can speak to Dieter, that would be great. So this is important for me to show you this just because uh, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, right? And I think this visual tells a lot each time I show it to you. On the top track, we have the Sony camera that was sitting on the tripod filming me in the bush the other day. On this track here that I'm highlighting, that's the phone that was sitting in the kettle fountain. For those of you that didn't watch the first part, I was talking to Adrian DeShriver, which was another gentleman that was tied into this gentleman. Uh, they used to go on adventures together. They were filming buddies. Uh, anyways, this is part two. So we're six minutes and 30 seconds into the interview in the woods I did the other day. What I just played for you I'm getting large shivers across my neck for some reason right now on shoulders. Um, what I just played for you where he says, uh, got to speak to it, right? He wants Dieter. That is exactly right here. I said at the top, I'd like to speak to Dieter. Uh, if I can speak to Dieter, that would be great. That'd be great. Okay, so here's the space that I left them to speak. And I put, like they filled it with those words that I put on the screen. I left them space. That's what they said. Yes, it's a little clanky and choppy, but you can clearly even hear the guy's name, Dieter. I'll play it for you again right now. Right, he wants Dieter. Boom, Dieter right there. Uh, Dieter, you were a cine cinematographer who obviously loved to make wildlife videos, movies. I'm sure your material is still watched today. Okay, so I'm watching along and the same thing happens again. I'm talking to Dieter. I said, I'm sure your material is still watched today. And so I'm visually watching on this screen. I see that I left them, you know, five or six seconds here to speak. I said, well, what did they say? So I highlighted it uh, right here. I listened to it once and I knew exactly what they said. I'm sure your material is still watched today. Okay, I'm sure your material is still watched today. And then they said the following... I hear, nice work, that's so respectful. I think maybe they're saying I'm showing him respect by praising his work. Do you miss hanging out in the jungles and Africa and everywhere else that you were? 
Check out this next one. I find it very interesting. I asked them a question, you know, did you miss all these places you used to film right here? Africa and everywhere else that you were. Okay, so did you miss those places? Now look, it. I left them lots of time here for them to answer. The first four seconds, there's no words. There's no answer. Don't know if they're thinking about it, whatever, right? You would think if this is just random, it's just water coming down from the tap, there'd be some garbage in there, but there's nothing. And then he clearly answers the question right here. So did you miss those places? Only when you went to leave. So, I mean, that makes perfect sense. He's in Africa shooting, doesn't miss the place till all of a sudden, oh, geez, I'm out of Africa tomorrow. Now he's going to miss the place. Oh, and I know that some of you are impatient. You don't want to see this. You just want to see the answers. So I'm going to stop showing this format right now but to me this is just as interesting uh, seeing these little anomalies like this big space in here where they say nothing or can you just experience all that from where you are now So Dieter, I read that you had uh, numerous close encounters in the bush. Um, you were swimming with uh, something to do with an inflatable pelican and you were in the water and then you received a bunch of burns from too much contact with that water, acidic water or something. <laughs> How did that make you feel? That's the craziest thing to me. That is the craziest response, right? How did that water feel? Here I am talking to a guy who's been dead for 30 years. I ask a specific question, how did the water feel? He's like, that water burned like coffee, hot, yes. Okay, I couldn't make this up. If I was going to make this up, I'm so smart, I would have never said those crazy words because to me, that's just laughable. But I bet you, if we could find somebody that was on his crew while he did that Pelican River thing, I bet you they discussed it at some point. He said it burns like hot coffee. This is crazy to me. What were you willing to do to get the perfect photographic shot? Dieter, you also apparently had a close call with an elephant where it said, I read that you narrowly avoided being trampled or mauled. Was that your fault with the elephant? Now, apparently, in 1993, when you were 56 years old, you were up in this... Um, you were up in an aircraft... Uh, hot air balloon, experimental. And did it get tangled in the trees?
something very interesting to note about that response. He verified the story that was told by his friend in the beginning that I played for you about the day he died. The camera got caught in a tree, right? As I sat that day, so Sunday, this is two days ago, I sat in the bush and I did that interview with the spirits. I didn't know anything about that because I hadn't watched that movie yet called The White Diamond from 2004. I came home that night and I watched the documentary and then I heard the whole story of how he died and everything. But that day I didn't know anything about it. So there's no way as I filmed this that I personally knew that a camera was caught. So we know that answer did not come from me in any way, shape or form. I didn't project it. It wasn't mentally recorded from my thoughts or anything. It had to come from some exterior source that knew that that camera had got caught. Dieter Plog. Why did you remove your safety belt? Do you regret removing your safety belt? Apparently you plummeted like 50 meters to your death on the jungle floor. During your free fall, what was going through your mind? Did you think that you might somehow grab the trees and slow your descent? Or did you just know it was over? Do you have any plans of coming back to Earth? And if so, would you be a wildlife photographer again? Dieter and Adrian, do you two ever hang out or see each other in the afterlife? Do you work together on any projects in the afterlife? What's the most important thing to know about wildlife photography? A lot of our animals are going extinct here on Earth. Tigers and certain elephants and bears and you name it. In the afterlife, do you have all kinds of animals that you can take pictures of there? Do you spirits have a message for any of our viewers today? If so, please state their name and leave them a message. Michael, you did something in August that the spirits don't reckon with. I think you already know this, and they're just confirming that you need to fix it. And I'm sure as soon as you see this message, whoever you are, you're going to know it right away is the feeling I'm getting. You already know you did something that wasn't agreeable. Uh, last thing I'd like to note is that my brother takes a lot of wildlife photography, so I think he's somewhat akin to you two gentlemen. Have you seen any of his photographs? And if so, what do you think of them? Uh, 
All right, well, love, peace, joy, and adventure to you two gentlemen and to my spirit team as well. I'm going to send out some light to you guys. Filled with the beauty of the forest. Cheers to you, gentlemen. Thank you for coming through if you did. I got shivers across my neck and shoulders just now. Is that a plane going over? Maybe we get a message on the sound of the plane? Okay, so this is weird. As that plane flew overhead and I'm waiting for a message, I'm looking at my recordings here and the Sony that hasn't recorded anything the entire time, which I showed you guys earlier, now contains messages and it jumps out to me and I knew that the message that they were sending was on that audio recording instead of the one I've been using for the entire uh, video that I've been making. So I don't know what this message means. It's odd. It comes through fairly clear. Some kind of prophecy or something? I don't know. I got a wet butt. It's definitely beautiful out here in the forest.